what his task is. Oh, okay. Yeah, my name's uh, Rob Stratton. Um, and I think the task of the Judicial Committee, again, is I think I, the other gentleman stated it clearly. Our, our job is to not use our personal judgment at all, but whether to see the rules were broken or not. Okay, and let's go to Mike Seebeck. Uh, yeah, um, 24 year life member of the party, been active in multiple states, multiple levels through over the years, multiple committees. Um, first time on the, on the JC. Can't really add any more to what everybody else has said so far, though. All right, thank you. We have about a minute left. I would like the petitioner and the respondent to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Mike Janice. Uh, I am the at-large for the Libertarian Party of Wisconsin. I've been a member and uh, active XCOM member for uh, about five, six years, uh, secretary, and, and again, now at large. I was a rep before, uh, district rep before, before that. And uh, thank you for hearing my case. Thank you. And the respondent? I assume that means me, or it could also mean the, the region reps. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think there's... The Probably multiple respondents, but I'm I'm certainly uh, happy to happy to take the lead. Now, my name is Angela McArdle. I'm the chair of the National uh, Libertarian Party, and I'm here to you know give a response. All right, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I believe that uh, completes the five minute introduction session. We are now in the. It does. Uh, let's see the the. Petitioner arguments are first. They are interruptible for questions by the Judicial Committee. And uh, we have 10 minutes for that. I'm sorry, 20 minutes for that. So will the petitioner please present his best arguments? And of course, uh, you if you have a proxy who uh, you want to uh, assign to speak for you, you may do so. All right, I think I'll, I'll speak uh, for myself right now. So uh, the chair of the Libertarian Party of Wisconsin signed a regional agreement with all, without authorization from the LPWI ex, uh, Executive Committee, which also he, he must have. The LNC bylaws clearly state the regional agreement must be signed by affiliate parties by mutual consent. If our chair was not authorized to sign the agreement on behalf of the affiliate party, the agreement did not have consent, and the agreement is not valid. So I want to make it clear we're not withdrawing from the region. Uh, as far as Libertarian Party of Wisconsin is concerned, it was invalid from the start. We notified the secretary of the unauthorized agreement as soon as we could and prior to it being ratified. Instead of attempting to re uh, rectify the issue or at least probing into it, she replied condescendingly and proposed a ratification by the LNC. She did say the ratification was so that uh, we would have an avenue to appeal, which is why we're here today. Now, the Judicial Committee isn't here to decide or interpret the uh, Wisconsin bylaws, but they do need to be brought up to solidify why our chair didn't have uh, the sole discretion to sign the regional agreement. So our first bylaw is the Libertarian Party of Wisconsin bylaw, Article 2, Section 1. The chair shall be the chief executive officer of the party, holding the powers of admin... What's that? Oh, all right. <laughs> holding the power. All right. So let me start that one again. The chair shall be the chief executive officer of the party, holding the powers of administration pertaining to the ordinary business affairs of the party and such other powers as may be delegated by the executive committee. This is the bylaw that was used to authorize uh, on behalf of the chair uh, the signing. So let's break it down a little bit. So the first is the chief executive officer. The chief executive officer is has administrative leadership interpretation of the uh, policies, strategic planning, personal personnel management, coordination of the board, public representation, reporting, things like that. Does not give them author authorization to sign agreements um, unless it was authorized by the executive committee. The next up is the line that says the ordinary business affairs. Uh, one interpretation is the ordinary business uh, refers to regular and routine matters handled by the organization during its standard meetings. Obviously, a regional agreement is not that. Another interpretation is ordinary business may be defined as day-to-day -day operations. 
regional agreements are every two years, not day to day. Now, uh, if you want to say that it is routine, that's one thing. Um, I don't think it's re routine enough to say that it is ordinary business, but let's disagree. Uh, but the agreement put financial obligations and liabilities on the party, which would disqualify it as ordinary business. It also added some policy changes, which would also disqualify it as ordinary business. Um, I pointed out that it was ambiguous. Um, I don't think it is. I think it's pretty plain. However, um, our chair decided to talk to both a, and again, this I could be wrong, but talk to an internal parliamentarian. And he was, uh, the, our parliamentarian suggested that he talk to the XCOM. And he talked to someone outside the party. And that person said that he did not because of the, this, uh, this bylaw. So again, ambiguous. Uh, we have multiple interpretations, um, but it is the obligation of the chair to uh, come to the ex executive committee to interpret that uh, the, amb the ambiguity. Um, uh, if there is any ambiguity, Rona indicates it would be prudent for the chair to have consulted with the XCOM to avoid overstepping his authority. Uh, the chair has also said on numerous occasions that one of the reasons he did not bring up the agreement was to avoid an argument. He knew full well that the executive committee would not agree to it, and something so contentious is, again, not ordinary. And something that went against the guidance of the executive committee would be unauthorized. So next up is uh, um, another issue we have with the signing. Uh, that's the financial obligation that it, that it required. Uh, our, our LPWI Constitution, Article 5, Section 1, states, the executive committee shall be responsible for the control and management of all the affairs, properties, and funds of the party consistent with its, with its bylaws and any resolutions which may be adopted at in convention. Only the executive committee may spend the monies of the party. Uh, I won't go into the, the regional one agreement too much, but there is a tra travel compensation which allows mul uh, uh, part, uh, that allows the represent uh, the regional reps to ask for up to a thousand dollars multiple times a year, and it would force Wisconsin to uh, join into those negotiations. Now, a negotiation with other states as means that the other states could override Wisconsin's negotiation and vote to have Wisconsin pay for its fair share. Unfortunately, the uh, our, well, fortunately for us, the uh, our, our, uh, our bylaw states that only the executive committee may spend the monies of the party. This puts a financial obligation. So not only is it that against the bylaws, it also negates the uh, regular business or ordinary business, excuse me. Um, so um, I really appreciate the, the, the brief that the reps sent that said, hey, we're not going to ask for money. That's fine, but it doesn't hold any relevance since it wasn't signed under those terms. Um, hey, and again, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the other thing, so the order of events is that our chair decided to finally tell us that he signed the original agreement days before the convention. So we brought as many executive member, executive committee members as we can to discuss this. We didn't want anything to be unilaterally chosen. I didn't want to say, hey, I think this is wrong, so I'm going to cause a fuss. I'm going to email the LNC. No, we get as got as many people in the room as possible to make sure that we were interpreting interpreting this correctly. And let me make, make make this perfectly clear: we are not withdrawing from from that agreement. It was not authorized by the XCOM. It was not authorized. So that special meeting did nothing to invalidate the agreement. It was already invalid from the start. So. Uh, you can complain all about the meeting and how it wasn't legitimate or anything like that. That meeting did nothing to legitimize or not legitimize uh, the signing of the agreement. Um, so the meeting could have been an email. And if the meeting doesn't have any validity at all, it doesn't negate the, the agreement. Uh, excuse me. I'm, I lost my place on my notes. Uh, even though it may not have validity and you can decide from there. Uh, it doesn't negate the agreement was not authorized to be signed to begin with. The <laughs> LNC secretary should have taken steps to mitigate the, the allegation by members of the executive committee, but she didn't. 
one of the issues in uh, one of the, uh, I believe in the response was that uh, we don't really have a way to, uh, we don't have a mechanism to change regions in the middle of the year. And again, I want to make this clear. We're not withdrawing from the agreement. It wasn't valid to begin with. Now, I get that there is no mechanism to change regions mid-year, which was why I addressed before the convention. But if the agreement was not valid, you may consider the entire region invalid and should be disbanded. However, I think we can all agree that it's extreme. And I don't think there's anyone here that wouldn't agree to just remove Wisconsin from that agreement, modify the National Party sustaining member in that region, uh, and go from there. Uh, and modify the regional representation from there, excuse me. Uh, I'm sure the chairs are quite capable of deciding regional representations that comply with the bylaws. So I think I addressed most of the uh, the address of the uh, the respondents and the uh, the briefs. However, uh, I did tongue in cheek say that if you have any complaints about what we did as the committee, you can talk to our judicial committee. And they said that was we didn't have one. That's correct. We don't have one, but we can make one ad hoc by the executive committee. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, are there any other speakers for the petitioner? Time. All right, uh, we appear to have um, some extra time here. Hold on, I think I believe Joel, Phil Anderson was going to speak. Yes, uh, uh, we uh, we are available for questions, but only from. Um, I'm sorry, are you speaking uh, for the speaks. petitioner? Yeah, speak as a petitioner. Okay, thank you, Phil. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Phil Anderson, LPWI, member of the state party for 11 years, national party for about the same amount of time, various positions and leadership positions. I just want to bring up one, one point that Michael didn't emphasize, and that is the idea of ordinary business. If there was ambiguity in the mind of the chair or anyone else regarding whether this was ordinary business or not, all the conventions or pre-convention deliberations regarding uh, regions and such, every other convention has been at least discussed by the executive committee uh, of our state affiliate and some guidance given or suggestion given uh, to the delegation before they went to the national convention. Um, so there, even though how it reads, you could argue over what ordinary businesses are not, uh, the precedent had been set in terms of how we had been and how various XCOMs, various people serving, had interpreted that and, and gone about that business. And furthermore, the fact that the chair brought up that um, one of the reasons he did not make that available, that these negotiations to join Region 1 available to the executive committee was because they were going to cause some commotion, some argument. And uh, so he, in my mind, clearly knew as well that they had been they had been discussed by the entire XCOM before convention in previous uh, cycles. So it's pretty clear that he was, to me, that he was avoiding that and thereby acknowledging that it was something that the XCOM should have been involved with. Thank you. And to fur further emphasize the uh, uh, the precedents, he was uh, at those those XCOM meetings and spoke on behalf of the the region alignment uh, two years ago and four years ago. All right, Mr. Secretary, how are we doing on time? Beg pardon, eight eight forty five. All right, it said eight forty eight minutes forty five seconds. Yes. All right, thank you. All right, uh, it is now appropriate for uh, judicial committee members to ask any questions they have. Uh, Stefan, I see your hand up. Go ahead. I've got a few, and if I go too long, I can hold some of them for later. Uh, this is for uh, uh, for the appellant, uh, the petitioner. Uh, I, out of as a matter of curiosity, if I understand. Uh, if you're successful in having uh, the JC rule your way, you would not be held to be in the regional in the region one, and you would have no representative on the LNC. Is that correct? We would not have a formal represent, uh, representative. However, we would have the vice chair. Um, I did try to uh, get representation at convention, but because it was ratified and it was so solid, okay. most people didn't want to touch our region. I understand. So I guess our state I don't, or other region. Why would Wisconsin? prefer to have no representative now to being part of a region with two representatives. What, what's, why does that even make sense? So first of all, we don't agree with the, the agreement that as it stands, um, 
the ex the executive committee doesn't have any say in what the region does only the chair does um it is binding to the point where we can't uh, actually re be removed from the the region unless everyone agrees to it um we didn't appreciate the uh the uh the financial obligation that it, that it re that it required uh at least at the time and then uh uh we can be a rep we can be represented through the uh the vice chair okay all right uh let me ask um um you said the uh the chair doesn't have the authority to enter into such agreements um without, without authorization from the XCOM, yes why does the XCOM have the authority to do it because we can manage the affairs of the party okay that's fine um if 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 Wisconsin knew the deadline was coming up at the convention, why didn't you have a, a vote and a meeting and say what you were going to do, what the chair was authorized to do, what was your plan up leading that last week before the the final deadline? What was what was your plan actually? The uh the idea was that region six would be a renewal, and a renewal would be somewhat more ordinary business than a renegotiation of of a. Uh, of the of the agreement we'd have we have different policies we have different uh financial obligations stuff like that if, was, was the if, chair was the chair told to renew it was, was not it... told to renew um however i did ask on several occasions what 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 the uh the the plan was and kind of brushed brushed me off if he had renewed would you have, would you have said that was also outside of his authority if he had renewed with the, with the other region again that's more in line with with uh, ordinary business again we'd have the same policies it would be a continuation of previous uh of agree of agreements again uh continuation of policies stuff like that okay so, so it would be more ordinary business all right since all this happened has the has lp wisconsin um have you taken a vote of the of the XCOM or the or, or your board uh, specifically saying that the chair does not have the authority to enter into such agreements or is it still sort of the way it was and up in the air we did have we handled it at the special meeting and we also um continued that that train of thought by uh censoring our chair and suspending them uh, right but your special with, meeting hold on your special yeah. meeting uh, first of all there's there's doubt about whether that was a valid meeting but even if it was a valid meeting as far as i understand it you simply re you instructed him to to not enter the agreement it, it, it wasn't a statement that he has no authority to enter such agreements it's just you're overriding what he did no, we that meeting stated that he did not have authorization, and that we requested him to to okay. back out of that agreement. Okay, one more question. In your in your view, how the way this works with the LNC, how would you propose going forward that the LNC determine who, uh, when when a state affiliate has the authority to, uh, or, or when they have entered into a region, and when they when and who has the authority to communicate that to the LNC? How are, how is the LNC supposed to know? So the so it should be that the chair does have that authority if if given to, to the XCOM to, to sign that right. So we did notify the LNC that it was unauthorized before the convention, before it was ratified. So it was it's not necessarily we're not you know a week after saying wait a minute this isn't right. We said it from the very beginning of when we found out this information. But that's the question about whether he did authorize it. You, you you informed him of the outcome of a meeting, the validity of which is in dispute. I mean, I'm just so wondering... that, that meeting. So that meeting didn't. So that meeting didn't negate, negate the fact that he was not authorized to sign it. It was not authorized to be signed. I understand, but I'm story. I'm assuming that uh, I, I I guess your chair is online here. I assume your yes. chair is on your is still part of your organization, and he probably would disagree that he didn't have the authority. So when you say you communicated to the LNC. You gave them an opinion. We we have to decide whether you're correct, right? Sure. I mean, that's that's the question at issue here, correct? Sure. Yeah, and I get and I the, the when I emailed the secretary and the chair, uh, I uh, added all of the ex executive committee on that as well. Um, I mean, there it wasn't just my opinion. Again, that's why we had that special meeting to make sure that we were at I at valid as we could in the short amount of time that we had, the three days, four days, whatever it was. It. We got, got it. So so let's say okay. he had renewed with the other region and sent the notification to the secretary, and we just counted that as part of that, that region, and we move forward. And three months later, someone someone in, in, in on your board com complained and says, oh, he didn't actually have the authority to do that. We want you to unwind that region now, three months later. How are we supposed to know who has authority 
I mean, but that's not what we're doing, are we? I mean, I I notified the secretary, the people that are filing the the these agreements before the the deadline of the convention. So I mean, we could say what if all all day long, but that's not what happened. We we specifically okay. said no, this is not right, and as timely as we can, and before the deadline. All right, I'm gonna. Um, let uh, another JC member ask a question or some questions, and let's go to Blay first and then Rob. Mr. Chair, we have two minutes. You're muted, Blay. Sorry, one thing I had was, um, you know, amplifying a little on, on Stephen's question. There are three. Uh, you, why? Why is it better for you to have one rep, like the the vice chair, than than three reps? I don't understand what the what the harm is to you here in this case. I think it sets a precedence of 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 a our chair b accepting this reason as it is without uh, you know when we when we made it clear that we are not authorized for this. Um, and I would have rather have joined another region. I really would have. I tried. Don't get me, I I was sitting there though you know for the entire convention trying to get to a region but because it was ratified we couldn't so it's not that I didn't want to be in a region um I don't think this region aligns another with question our is why why is it better for you to have uh, only one you know rep in the vice chair than to have three at this point it'd be two right but it doesn't I mean it doesn't really matter for us no, it'd be three it's three all right um, right, the other question. Yeah, you know can, uh, I, can I? I'm going to rely on Phil on this one. I'm going to Phil Anderson. One, the other question is: How, how did uh, LP Wisconsin expect this to play out? Assuming they they knew in advance that they didn't have a chair, uh, that the chair was not authorized to do this, uh, the chair went ahead and did it, and then shortly before the deadline, if my understanding is correct, uh, he said, "Oh, he didn't have authority to do this." How did LP Wisconsin expect? that this would, would play out to, to begin with. I don't know we if I'm being be clear. A, we wanted to be in a different region. Let me, can but I answer that, have, Michael? All right. Yeah, go, ahead, please. go ahead, Phil. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The questions about whether or how many representatives we had are basically moot. The point is that we as a state affiliate have to, our, our bylaws and our rules and our understanding of our bylaws has to be coherent. It wasn't a question of, oh, we'd, we'd go through this process of addressing this, this situation where the chair is going rogue. And okay, intent... I, I, I moved on. I moved on from that question to another question. I'm sorry, there's two people that brought it up. So I want to address it. It didn't get addressed before. The point is not what, what's good now or what the, and actually it's not our problem, really, what the LNC should do about interpreting every 50 states uh, authority for people to sign. That's your issue. All we know is that we are documents have to work. Our XCOM has to represent our members in convention. And that's why we did that. Unfortunately, we had to, and we didn't find out about this until the Sunday before the convention. That's why it was dealt with late. Okay. Sure, we are I'm, I know. Um, find out well, gonna, about excuse me, Blaya. I'm going to, I'm going to, we're out of time, but I'm going to give us a couple of extra minutes here. Uh, Rob has had his hand up for a while. Uh, go ahead, Rob, make it quick, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Mr. Chianis, I, I think actually your strongest argument is one you made at the outset that this agreement, this regional agreement was void at the beginning, or to use lawyer speak, void ab initio. But but do you acknowledge that the um, your, your affiliate did not claim in its petition that the regional agreement um, that its chair signed was void at the beginning? All you said is that you're asking our committee to avoid it, that I and I just went back I and looked at your brief. So, sorry, I believe I said it was unauthorized. Okay, and so that that helps. And then the, my second question is, um, your so your chair in signing this agreement may have obligated um, your affiliate financially, but now that that obligation has been disavowed by you know these reps, I mean, what do you say to the argument that? your chair by signing in this regional agreement, um, you know, obligated your affiliate to spend funds, but it didn't actually result in the expenditure of funds. So signing the regional agreement 
was within the scope of the chair's authority of your bylaws. Do you see would, my point? There's I a difference say, between spending and obligating. And I'm sorry, so I talked over you, but go ahead. Sir. So hindsight is 2020. It's still an obligation. It could still have been an obligation. It could be a Wisconsin share of thousands of dollars which he did not have any authorization to do. The other thing that it also negates the ordinary business by giving us a, a obligation or a liability um, for that money. So again, it's not ordinary business either. Okay, thank you. That's all I have for now, Mr. Chair. Right. Um, we're going to add on a couple minutes at the end of the respondents time for additional questions as well, uh, just to keep it fair and balanced. Um, now, at this point in the agenda, the response from the respondent is in order. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Montoni. If it's all right with you, I'll, I'll speak briefly, pass it briefly to one of the Region 1 reps, and then briefly to Mr. Jacobs, who I believe was, was retained to give some advice and, and help to, to one of the interested parties in this. Um, so I was very busy with the National Convention while all of this was going on. Um, I, I found out about it shortly afterwards um, at the LNC meeting at the National Convention. I ruled it in order to ratify um, the decision so that the aggrieved parties could have an avenue, avenue to appeal. And here we are. Uh, I do think that the LNC has the authority to ratify that decision in case that's been in dispute. Um, there's nothing precluding us from ratifying uh, any decision like this as far as I can tell in the national bylaws, uh, in Robert's Rules of Order, and so on and so forth. I took a look at the Libertarian Party of Wisconsin bylaws, obviously after the fact, and the national bylaws. I did notice that Article 2 uh, section of their bylaws designates the chair as the chief executive officer of their party, holding the powers of administration pertaining to the ordinary business affairs of their party. My perspective is that it is ordinary business to enter into regional agreements. We do it every two years. Lots of states have uh, just the chair do the negotiating. <clears throat> it's it's something that happens ordinarily. Uh, the bylaws, notably, I, I can't give you a quote because it's not in there. Their bylaws don't limit the chair's authority or prohibit him from entering into regional agreements. Um, the national bylaws also don't prevent chairs from entering into regional agreements on their own. Uh, the regional agreement, uh, from what I could tell, does not permit anyone to withdraw um, if it's going to impact the region's um, numbers. And I believe that it also says in that agreement that it was ratified upon signing. I think that the XCOM, their XCOM, also had an opportunity to rescind it on May 19th when Mr. Ecker notified them all that he had signed a regional agreement. And they didn't. And uh, I believe their May 20th meeting had a notice requirement deficiency. By no means do I mean to sound unsympathetic, but the National Party's position is that an agreement was entered into and it's valid. It is valid um, and it needs to be honored. And an entire region and the region reps shouldn't be upended and have damage uh, inflicted on the other states in that region. You know, I wish everyone the best of luck in sorting this out. Let me pass it over to Mr. Adam Heyman for a moment. Um, as the Region 1 rep. Yeah, hi. Uh, Adam Heyman, Nevada, one of the Region 1 reps, along with Roman Garcia of Arizona. I just want to address this uh, ostensible financial obligation um, in the Region 1 agreement. There, there is no such uh, obligation. Um, the clause says that they'll enter into an agreement if requested by the regional representatives, which we have not done and will not do. And although it wasn't in the agreement when the region one organizing meeting happened over Zoom with all the chairs, it was discussed this issue. And it was made perfectly clear that some states either could not or were not willing to uh, contribute to the travel expenses. And if that was the case, that was fine. Their obligation would be zero. Um, and in fact, um, what Roman and I decided to do just as to uh, uh, set up a GoFundMe page and just ask for voluntary contributions, which is what we have done. So there appear to be some confusion about financial obligation. There is none. I just wanted to put that to bed. All right. Thank you. And you had some uh, another speaker? Yes. Um, Mr. Jonathan Jacobs has just a couple of things to add as well. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, basically, 
I wanted to say here, I heard Mr. Chinese say that he tried. Frankly, he did not try hard enough. Um, there's been a lot of information, misinformation out here about parliamentary procedure. And the first one is that the um, LPNI can just interpret a bylaw anytime it so wishes. It can only do so when there is an, amb an ambiguity in that bylaw. And frankly, ordinary business is defined in Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, um, it occurs on, I have my copy here. Uh, it occurs in 922. It's the only time that the uh, wording is used, and it actually says uh, it is something that is not brought in, uh, or it is something that is uh, not considered at the annual, or something that is considered at meetings other than the annual meeting. It is not something required to be considered at the annual meeting or presumably a specific meeting. The word ordinary uh, also has a meaning, and I think that that is quoted. I uh, have my old copy of Black's Law uh, Dictionary here. And as an adjective, we won't be talking about the um, possibility of a uh, bishop or an archbishop uh, dealing with it as a noun. It refers to regular, usual, normal, common, often reoccurring, according to the established order. That's what we have here. Every two years, they have to enter into this agreement um, to if they want to be in a, you know, in a um, region. I'm looking at my notes here. My apologies. Um, the chair is given the authority. Um to conduct ordinary business, just in general. That authority was never taken away from him by the executive committee. In fact, the bylaws are, uh, excuse me, the constitution of the um, LPWI, section five, or article five, section two says, the executive committee shall be responsible for the control and the management of properties um, of the, uh, of the funds of the party consistent with the bylaws and any resolution that may be adopted to the convention. Uh, only the, uh, but the president is given, excuse me, the chair is given the authority as chief executive officer subject to that control. Well, the executive committee never controlled it. They never adopted a motion uh, that said, you have, that said, uh, come back to us and talk to us before you do it. That certainly was not the practice um, where they've done it. We can see that in one case, the minutes that they have produced actually said, actually showed somebody complaining that they, why didn't, why wasn't this brought up earlier? It's not something that is reserved for a particular meeting. Um, we can go to the meeting of the 19th. I disagree a little bit with the filing from the Libertarian National Committee. Uh, I think that this board, that this executive committee had the ability at that point to rescind the, um, to order the chair to remove his signature and back out of the agreement. It was a properly called meeting. They had that authority. And Robert, for about the last 20 years, uh, if anybody is here from Virginia, they will recognize this copy. This is the 10th edition. It was published in 2000. They actually made a change, and they said, references to federal, state, and local laws are restricted, whenever appropriate, to procedural rules of law prescri uh, prescribed by such laws. In recognition of the fact that parliamentary procedure, uh, that the rules of parliamentary procedure are concerned with the process by which a deliberative assembly arrives at a decision, not by the wisdom or even the legality of the decision itself. For similar reasons, the rule against prohibiting rescission of a motion, which is in the nature of a contract, has been eliminated. It would have been perfectly in order, no violation of the rule, had they rescinded it at that point. They had some other ways to deal with it. If they didn't want to do it quite at that meeting, that would have been proper. They could have scheduled an adjourned meeting, which is a continuation of this meeting. They didn't do it. They came out to this other meeting that had some absentees that required 
I believe, three weeks notice and had less than 24 hours notice and tried to do something at that meeting. Uh, basically, as I've said in my filing, this executive committee had two years to issue the chair instructions on this matter. They could have taken it at the meet. They could have given him, him instructions to reverse the action on the meeting of the 19th. And they did not do either. The problem here is with the action or lack of action of the executive committee. Thank you. All right. Any questions from the Judicial Committee members? Rob, you had your hand up first. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll direct this one to Mr. Jacobs first. So, um, and, and it's similar to what I asked um, Mr. Chian Chianese, um, but it, and, and specifically I'm asking about the Wisconsin affiliates bylaws. So, and I, I, I think for what, maybe I'm up in the night on this, but I think by the time the agreement has been signed and all this stuff about ordinary business or unusual businesses, you know, the horse has left the barn at that point. So I think it's just unfortunate that the focus has been on everything after the fact. I'm I'm looking at this. Was it was it void at the outset? And, and so if you're able to answer this question, looking at the Wisconsin bylaws, is the chair precluded from entering into a regional agreement like this where he is either obligating his affiliate to spend money or spending money. So that's my first question to you, Mr. Jacobs. I don't believe that he could, in the agreement, authorize the spending of money. However, that was a separate agreement from what I understand. It was not part of the regional agreement. That agreement might have been void, but the regional agreement was not. Help me understand. There's two agreements you're talking about. Break down what two agreements we're talking about. Well, there was one saying we're forming a regional agreement. Oh, and we might do something else with this. And the other and the other one had to deal with the financial arrangement. There is a question that I certainly have about the financial arrangement. Can the chair enter into that agreement? But that is not part of the agreement into the region. That is a separate okay. agreement. OK, so I want to go back and look at that. I guess I am operating under the assumption that they're the same agreement. But at least I'll... that's my understanding of it. OK. Um, and then another question, and, and this is probably I'll probably put this to uh, Ms. McArdle as well. But um, is it would it be I get that there, you know, there's a claim that it's not fair that this region was formed. Um, and for you know not to include wisconsin what about the other regions that are formed is it fair to them if you know we say this region was kind of cobbled together inappropriately and that dilutes their representational strength do the other regions and other at-large reps let's say even officers have a complaint here that one one group is getting a disproportionate amount of representation by this regional agreement would you like me to answer that? Sure. I put it to JJ, but ladies first. I I don't think I don't think so. I don't see how it could be. There's another region that's also a, a quote unquote super region. And I think a lot of regional agreements were mm -hmm. either entered into or the states started trying to form them prior to the national convention. Everybody had a shot. I, and, I, and, and I agree. So okay. And then just Chair McCarl, maybe same question to you. I mean, what do you say about this argument that this agreement was void at the beginning because the chair of the Wisconsin affiliate lacked the authority to, to spend or obligate money by entering into the agreement? I just, you, and I think in fairness, I don't think you addressed that. I looked at your brief. I looked at Mr. Jacobs' brief. I looked at the uh, Region 1 rep's brief. Nobody addressed it, but I think in fairness, they didn't address it because it wasn't really clearly raised by the uh, appellants. Whether or not the the agreement was void on its face? Void at the outset. So they're oh, asking I, us to void it, but right. I, I, I do think, not think a strong argument is that, 
And I put a link in the chat, by the way, just, you know, there, there's a concept that agreements purportedly entered into are are bad from the get-go for various reasons, like the person's a minor and they can't enter into contracts or they're, you know, not of sound mind. And then here the argument would be the chair did never had the authority to enter into an agreement that spent money or or stretching it a bit obligated money. So just giving you another shot there, what what would you say without maybe having the benefit, you know, maybe I'm thinking if this is an issue, we want to give the parties a chance to do supplemental briefing on this. Um, do you have well, any thoughts at this time on that? Argument? I think I, I think I addressed this in my um, my opening statement. I don't think the agreement was void. I don't think it. I don't think that the chair lacked the authority to enter into the agreement. There was nothing in the bylaws um, of Wisconsin, and there's nothing in the national bylaws that prevented him from entering into an agreement or that discussed how regional agreements are entered into. Um, so so, so you think that the language in the Wisconsin bylaws saying the chair can't spend money, the, it's the executive committee that gets to spend money, and that this agreement, that this regional agreement did at the time uh, obligate each, each, I guess, member affiliate to spend money. You, you... Well, it was theoretical, though. There was no dollar amount agreed. Uh, there's there's no dollar amount if if it had said you know wisconsin you know each state must pay you know 100 200 500 dollars per lnc meeting i think it would be a different different scenario but that's not what the agreement said uh, could i add something please all right um okay. hold, hold on and one moment, I'm done. hold on one moment please uh mr secretary stop the clock for just a moment for some housekeeping uh, first of all, what is our time left? Eight minutes. All right. Um, Mr. Heyman, I saw your hand go up a little while ago. Are you still interested in speaking? Yeah. All right. Oh, all right. Hold on one second. Let's let um, Mr. Jacobs complete his thought and then. Uh, uh, all right. That's fine. Mr. Jacobs, then we'll go to Stefan and then uh, Adam and then Blay. And please try to keep your remarks brief and your questions brief so that we can uh, get around to everyone. All right, Mr. Secretary, go ahead and restart the clock and go ahead, Mr. Jacobs. Thank you. Um, basically, I can say that there is a prohibition on the chair spending money and that the whatever agreement was there was not actually spending money. So it would still not be applicable. Thank you. All right. Let's go to Stefan. Okay. A couple of quick questions. Um, so my understanding is most members of the executive committee of, L of Wisconsin, except for the chair, I assume, oppose the region. And what would happen if they simply disaffiliated from the LNC and then they petitioned to join back a month later? What I assume they could pull that move and then the one of the reps of region two would a uh, region one would disappear is that correct uh a angela miss mccardle um i think that's that's possible i can't uh, yeah i don't know what the outcome would be actually uh, i don't think that states can this was decided in 2022 states can't disaffiliate on their own the national party has to be the one to disaffiliate that was dealt with with the Libertarian Party of New Mexico. Uh, if I can add, I also don't think that there is any mechanism for changing the district due to disaffiliation. I think right. it would be set if that would happen. All right. I believe okay. I said Mr. I believe I said Mr. Heyman next. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to clear up the confusion about uh, an extra agreement or something that was financial in nature that that's a purely hypothetical thing there's only one agreement the region one agreement and that clause is designed to just give the chairs a heads up that the regional rep might request an additional agreement to discuss the, the financing and we never did we decided to go with the gofundme route instead because it was just much cleaner and easier all right thank you let's go to blay and uh mr secretary what is our time left uh, just under six minutes. Is that including the uh, two or three minutes that I said we would give this sec uh, section? It does. 
Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Blake. Um, yeah, just a quick question for uh, Ms. McArdle. Uh, you were informed uh, by Wisconsin that uh, that this agreement was uh, void ab initio. What steps did you take to um, uh, to, to verify that uh, that the chair actually had the uh, the agreement? That's my only question. Had had, had validly entered into the agreement. By looking at the at the Wisconsin bylaws, but you know, I think I did mention at the at the beginning that while all of this was going on, you know, I was planning national convention, dealing with Secret Service, trying to pull everything together. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have my hands on this. So when this came up, we talked about it at the in person meeting at the at the national convention. There was like a quick cursory look through their through their bylaws by a handful of us, and we made a motion so that we could address it here. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions from the Judicial Committee membership? I have a couple. Go ahead, Stefan. No, that's oh, me. Mike oh, I'm sorry. Me. I'm sorry. That was Mike. Yeah. Apologies. I can't raise my hand because I'm the host. Um, this is from Ms. McArdle. The, what is the normal process uh sequence of events i guess for a region to be con uh confirmed to be formed and operative regions in their documentation to the secretary all righty um follow up to that is in this case was there any activity by the secretary which went beyond her authority or instructions on how to handle this? Um, not to my knowledge. So she does uh, her checks. Um, I think I think staff also verifies, you know, the, the number of national memberships in um, in each state to make sure that they they qualify and, and the agreements get handed into her. All right. So ratific about it on the list. So ratification is not a, not a normal occurrence for the for regions to form. Uh, ratification is not necessary. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we have three minutes. All right. Um, whose hand did I see? Was that Stefan? Yes. Go ahead. Ms. McArdle, um, if I'm trying to understand what would happen here if if uh, we, we rule for the uh, petitioner, um, would that reduce the number of representatives by one? And what effect would it have, say, retroactively on any previous uh, uh votes let's say and resolutions of the lnc well i would have to rule on that and i don't know what that would be off the top of my head but it would probably create um quite the controversy however i rule on it you know i'm sure people are going to be upset uh i think that once something is done on the list generally it's it's one and done uh, that's that's my perspective, but I'm sure there are people who are going to disagree. So okay. I'd have to make an official ruling. And then a quick question for Mr. Jacobs. You you said that you think the LNC would have had the ability to rescind this uh, confirmation from the chair of Wisconsin. Um, I, I don't understand why you believe that because – Okay, and not the LNC. I believe the executive committee. Of the um, of the Wisconsin affiliates. Oh, I see. Okay. Had that ability at the uh, meeting of five nineteen. Okay, they did not exercise it. Uh, isn't there a provision about this region formation where once you get over a ten percent mark, the region cannot the, the state affiliate cannot leave the region at all? Uh, why why wouldn't that uh, be implicated in the attempt to undo joining a region? Uh, that would reduce the number down to the to the next ten percentile mark. Well, it I has to, it has to deal if you're asking me that question yeah. with how Robert treats contracts, and I'm not certain. I would have to take a look at the bylaws again to see how this did work to see if this was actually in the bylaws. I'm not certain that it is, but uh, Robert basically says procedurally, we're not going to worry about contracts. That has to go to civil court. Potentially, if there had been that situation, it would come before this body as well, or it might come before civil court. 
Uh, but it is not something that RONR deals with in that respect. It says it's not out of order. That's what I have to give the answer for. It's not. It would not have been out of order to do it. It seems to me it's up to the LNC to determine how many reps exist in the Libertarian Party structure. And if our bylaws specify that um, a number of reps are created by state affiliates entering into um, um, regional agreements, it's not really particularly germane. In other words, let's say a, a state affiliate had a lawsuit over this regional agreement and they won. That doesn't necessarily bind the Libertarian Party and how we create reps and determine who the reps are. Like it's sort of a separate thing. But anyway, that's a legal issue. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, we're at time. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to go into our uh, petitioner rebuttal, uh, which is uh, you have allotted five minutes for that. So, petitioner, go ahead with your uh, five minute rebuttal. Sure. So one one of the big things is, did I try hard enough? Um, so this was brought on by surprise. So it's actually really hard to have a consistent and thought of, thought through approach to rebut this in a timely manner. That's why we had the secondary meeting so that we can discuss it amongst everyone as much as we could and have a course of action after that. Uh, I don't I don't believe that the L I mean, I, I don't have any concern that the LNC has the right to ratify it. That wasn't the question. Uh, we did our best to notify the uh, the secretary that it was unauthorized and she should have done some due, due diligence. Um, so uh, we, we, we one of the items was that the chair can can negotiate or sign or sign. Someone's doing a fax. <laughs> uh, so very uh, old school. Whoever's doing that, right. nice job. Um, so we don't have any. All right. So we don't have any. Uh, uh, now I lost my train of thought. Um, we don't have any problems with the chair negotiating the the regional agreement. We do have a problem with him signing it without the authorization from the the XCOM. Um, Again, uh, next up, the entire affiliate needs to consent. So, yeah, it was said that the um, we don't have a specific guideline that says he can't sign the, the 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 regional agreement, but we do say that he can do again ordinary business that is day to day affairs that is ordinary, not a different region, not different policies, not different um, obligation, not different liability. Again, that 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 uh. That regional uh, request for money is a liability. They could have asked for money. They could have made us pay our fair share. That is a liability. Um, and that voids the whole ordinary business altogether. Um, the other thing with the Roner, the part that it does uh, of Robert's Rules of Order, the only thing that does, uh, the, the 922 that uh, Jacobs mentioned, uh, talks about ordinary business that actually talks about um, business that is uh, regular during re regular business meeting. That stuff is not part of um, annual business. That's what it was calling out of uh, out of order or, or however it was said. So that's all I got. But I'm going to give uh, my remaining time to Phil Anderson. Thank you. I just wanted to point out that and a lot of the questions being asked here are important, but the most important and the first question that needs to be answered is, is this agreement or was it was it void from the start? And in my mind, clearly it was. I practice real estate compliance for a living. I have to examine the contracts of uh, uh, hundreds of contracts a year. And everything. Every one of the things that comes up is our LLCs, trust estates, who's authorized to, si to sign and how that should be built into any trust, LLC, et cetera. Clearly, our bylaws are a little vague on that, although the entire XCOM decided that it wasn't ordinary business. Uh, but even so, we those these are our bylaws. And the idea that, number one, that Ms. McArdle mentioned, that we don't have the right to disaffiliate from the National Party, to me, sounds in error. But also that we decided uh, in, a, in a meeting that 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 was the, the interpretation of the bylaws. We're the ones that are assigned to that responsibility between conventions. And clearly, 
the conventions had spoken to and the previous XCOMs had spoken to as what the interpretation of that was. So even Robert's interpretation of it doesn't, tr doesn't trump. It's what the organization, the will and the wishes of the organization has expressed at convention clearly support what the fact that that uh, agreement was um, null and void on its face. Thanks. All right. Anyone else? Stefan, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, for Mr. Chinese, um, not to chide you for second guessing or anything like that, but would you concede now that it would have been better to for the XCOM to make it clear to the chair that he did not have the authority to enter into the Region 1 agreement? And, and even if he thought he had the implied authority to renew the other agreement and to communicate this to the LNC, do you, do you think that would have been the best way to proceed so the LNC knows? I mean, that's what we did. So um, when he announced it again, it was by surprise. So it wasn't like we had we, we had all our bylaws in front of us and we could say, hey, no, this is not correct. I mean, we did say, me and Phil, Phil and I both said, this doesn't sound right. Uh, what the hell? Um, and the next day we did come together and we said, hey, it's not okay. authorized. Can you it. please, I got you it. please I got uh, it. fix, our, fix okay. the issue? I got it. Let me have a follow up then. Um, Mr. Jacobs implied that you entering the regional agreement did not obligate uh, Wisconsin to any financial obligations. That was a separate agreement. Is that correct or is that not correct? So I posted the the actual wording that I have uh, in the chat. Um, it was you had. So the, the agreement is we had to enter negotiation uh, to fulfill that uh, that that thousand dollar request. So we would be, we could be override by other states saying, "Hey, Wisconsin needs to pay his fair share." So yeah, it is a, it's 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 entering but, through but another negotiation, the, but it is a, a liability. Is it a separate agreement or not? That's what I'm asking. So I would say it's it's part of the same agreement. We we have to be in that agreement, right? So so J Jacob is mistaken in believing that that obligation stemmed from a separate agreement. Oh, it's not a separate agreement. It is is agreement. required to to be to to enter into an okay. agreement or to, to negotiation. And to to clarify, it it is an obligation, just not a specific one, and not okay. not an obligation, as I understand it. And Mr. Chinese can correct me. Okay, but LPWI Jacob, can just say yeah, we're not gonna it. we're not gonna give any money. That would be violating the agreement. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chinese. So if Mr. If your chair had renewed the other agreement, which which region was the other agreement? Region six. If he had renewed that agreement, is there any financial obligation in that agreement? No, sir. So the, this is a, the only. I believe this is the only region that has this, this agreement as part of it. I could be wrong. Could be okay. And thing, then one more quick question for for Mr. An for Mr. Anderson. Um, you said that the XCOM decided the chair had no authority to do this in case it was vague. When did they decide this? Other than the meeting of questionable validity. That was the meeting I'm referring to. Okay, so there there has been no meeting since then that it that is uh, not challenged. That has so still to this day there's not been a clear statement by the XCOM that the, the chair has no authority to do this. There's been no, that's not accurate because we the, in the vote to censure, and then the vote to uh, the revo the vote to refer the matter to our bylaws committee. Both specifically stated all of the. the charges if you will right but those votes were right. in a meeting let's... those votes were in a meeting that's this questioned right question. but there but yeah. whether or not that meeting was in order it was at meetings that clearly were in order verified right. ratified agreed to in terms of proceeding farther all right we need to um bring this to a close because i believe we're over time mr secretary can you confirm that uh confirm we are three minutes over time all right so we're going to add uh three minutes to the respondents um um session go ahead um yeah thank you very much i i just want to reiterate that you know our interpretation is that the chair does have the authority to enter into regional agreements there's nothing prohibiting him from doing that in their bylaws there's nothing prohibiting him from doing that in the national bylaws um the ex their executive committee had the opportunity to rescind it on may 19th they didn't uh, we all have access to Wi-Fi, internet, so on and so forth. Uh, you have the the opportunity anytime you're in a meeting. Any of us here do 
to look up your bylaws and see what is and isn't allowed uh, to take a little bit of time to figure out what you're going to do. Um, I don't know what was going on there. Um, I wasn't there, but I think that they had that opportunity. And I think that the agreement is valid. It is not invalid. It was valid uh, the, the moment that they signed it. It was not unauthorized. Mr. Ecker had the authority to enter into it. And uh, that's that's the National Party's position. Uh, Mr. Mr. Heyman or, or uh, Mr. Jacobs, do you have anything to add? Yes, I do. Um, in general, I would note that two years is not a surprise. Uh, this was the amount of time that they had. I also that Mr. Chenise hosted part of the agreement here, and um, it does not obligate anybody to pay anything. It talks about a separate agreement uh, may allocate cost sharing equally and proportionally um, upon the percentage of national uh, sustaining membership in the regional states. One could be negotiated. What happens if the negotiation fails? We don't know, but they're not going to be obligated to pay it. They could easily say no. Yeah, let me just chime in and say that's my understanding as well. All right. Uh, we have a couple of Judicial Committee members with their hands up, or at least one anyway. Rob, go ahead, please. Sure. I'll I'll put this to really any of you three. So sometimes when uh, we're challenging stuff as an affiliate that our elections office does, they say, we just have a ministerial duty. We don't have any discretion to, uh, you know, say yes or no. We get paperwork in front of us, we stamp it, and then we've done our job. And anything beyond that is is outside of our scope of authority. So kind of my question then, is, it comes back to this LNC uh, acceptance of this regional agreement. Does the LNC policy manual or our parliamentary authority give any guidance on any due diligence on regional agreements? Because just there's been some suggestion that when this agreement came in, people just kind of looked at it, said, looks on its face like it's valid. You know, we're signing off on it and we're good to go. And it just I'm I'm probing a little to see if there is more of a duty there, um, again, from the policy manual. I don't think there's anything in our bylaws that would suggest that, that that's there. So also uh, our parliamentary authority. So that's my question to any of you three, if you have an answer there. Okay, let's start with Angela. Go ahead. I don't think that there's anything um, regarding like a review of states' bylaws anything like that bylaws interpretation for the LNC to do. I don't see anything in the, the, the policy manual or the bylaws. I know that the secretary and I believe with the help of staff verifies to make sure that there are enough members in the States when they form their regions. But beyond that, no, it's, it's not our job to, to comb through and find out, if there's any particular bylaws issue. Now, if something arises and, and comes up, you know, then somebody may look into it, but, but it's not an explicit duty. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, how are we doing on time? We have three and a half minutes. All right, um, the request was for all three of them to comment on that. Let's go to uh, Jonathan first. Thank you. Um, I would say this. In theory, under the parliamentary authority, the LNC could decide its own membership via a point of order uh, and possibly an appeal. That decision would be appealable to the JC. They could determine that somebody was not properly seated and um, via a point of order and that way determine that there was something not done properly and have this done that way they have not done that their substitution was not for somebody to raise a point of order about it but to do the motion for ratification um but yes yeah, somebody technically could raise a point of order that's that a particular regional representative 
or representatives were not legitimate delegate, were not legitimately uh, chosen. And that would be subject just to the general appeal process within the meeting. Uh, the chair would rule there would be an appeal in all probability. Whatever the decision there could be appealable to the uh, JC. OK, who was the third person who was it to ask to speak on this? That's uh, Mr. Adam Heyman. Go ahead, Adam. Um, I just want to chime in that I think it's the case that past practice is only a custom. And therefore not binding. It, if I if I could add on that, um, it is it's you'll find it in uh, Section 225 of Robert, which is binding. Um, Practice uh, custom is um, superseded by any kind of adopted rule. It's been in Robert specifically since the 2000 edition. All right. I believe we are out of time. Mr. Secretary, you can correct me on that if I'm wrong. We still have a minute and a half. All right. Anyone else? Any other questions from the JC members? Did Mr. Tarnoff have, have his hand up? Okay. Go ahead, Blake. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get a um, clarification on what, I mean, it's my understanding is that the um, complaint uh, came in at the at the very end of the uh, window for uh, forming agreements, that the uh, complaint by LP Wisconsin, that the, um, the fact that the chair had signed this agreement was a surprise. Um, I just wanted to know what did the LP Wisconsin expect was was going to happen? Um, did they think they were just not going to enter into an agreement and not uh, be involved in this process at all? I mean, you know, you had this window and the LP Wisconsin, apparently, if my understanding is correct, didn't take any action um, until they found out that their chair had done something. And then at the very end of the window took action. Am I, am I wrong about that? And if not, how, what did the LP Wisconsin expect was, was going to happen if not their chair enter this agreement? What, what were they expecting to happen with regard to forming this region? So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking to me. Uh, so we, so I believe. The petition, yes. So I believe that we were going to renew our regional agreement with six, which is more ordinary business than a completely different agreement. Um, that's what I expected. I, again, asked the chair a couple of times, like, hey, the re region rep is contacting me. What are we going to do? He's like, well, I'll discuss it at our re at our uh, at our executive meeting. All right. All right. So let's dis discuss it. Uh, and it wasn't a discussion. It was this is what I did. Mr. Chair, right. we are I believe, out of time. Yes, we're out of time, which uh, I believe brings us to the end of our agenda. One moment, please. All right, we have um, we have no remaining time. I I think, Mr. Secretary, is that accurate? I believe the last uh, our last segment was any other any other Q and A for either party. Okay, and we have, I think we scheduled up to 90 minutes. Is that correct? Uh, correct, and we have 18 minutes left in that period. All right, so we have 18 minutes for any additional Q&A. Are there any Judicial Committee members who have additional questions for either respondent or appellant? I am seeing none. So I believe that brings us to the end of our agenda. All right, Rob just threw his hand up. Go ahead, Rob. It's not a question, Mr. Chair. It is an editorial comment, but I'll say that this dispute helps me uh, favor replacing regions with an expansion of uh, elected at-large members through cumulative voting. We put forward a bylaws proposal to do that. We ran out of time mm -hmm. to consider that maybe in two years we will revisit that. And I'll say just, I, I looked into this question, our Utah chair, and I was, um, we're actually worse off than Wisconsin. Our, we don't, our XCOM couldn't limit our chair at all if he wants to enter into a region or not. 
I just think that's very uh, undemocratic, unrepresentative. And again, one reason why I just favor replacing regions with uh, an expanded at-large membership that we do proportionally through cumulative voting. All Thanks right. for allowing me my time on the soapbox. All right, Rob, thank you for your editorial content. And by the way, um, you're, you're going to need to make a um, $100 contribution to the Judicial Committee for uh, editorial time. Just kidding. I was going to say, how is that money going to get spent? <laughs> uh, let's see. On beer. Yeah. John, that's right. Wine and beer. Jonathan Jacobs, you have your hand up. Um, go ahead. Yes. I just wanted to add to this that in looking at the roles of uh, chairs and executive committees and what they can do, I did take a look at several other states and they want, they run from a chair having zero authority to a chair having absolute authority. This is a function of the state bylaws. And I would encourage any state that wishes to limit their chair to adopt a bylaw covering this. All right. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Any other questions? Jonathan, you still have your hand up. You have some. All right. I see it went down. No other comments or questions. I'm going to say that. I'd, I'd like to quickly ask Mr. Ecker if he felt that he had authority to enter into this agreement. What what, you know, what made him think he had authority to enter into this agreement? If uh, Mr. Ecker is willing to speak. Go ahead, Mr. Ecker. Uh, because I understood um, um, ordinary business to uh, include uh, regional uh, formation, which normally happens uh, 90 days before uh, a national convention. All right. Any others? Uh, Michael, go ahead. So uh, I want to point out the the discrepancy between the uh, response of, hey, regions form the last second all of the time to the fact that we should have done this two years ago, 90 days ago. Our, our XCOM was the week before. That is more time than most regions get to, to, to form. So having that wait to the last second on that day is not unheard of. We, no one should have been surprised that we waited until that day. If you've ever been in a regional agreement discussion, ever, it is not unheard of to be at zero hour signing the agreement. So let's just put that to rest of we were not prepared. This is how it happens. Jonathan, go ahead. If I may respond. Um, they had two years to basically say, we're going to adopt a rule that will say that the chair has to bring this back to the board. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what that refers to. Mm -hmm. uh, and they certainly have the authority to do it, mm -hmm. uh, but they didn't do it. All right. So far, I have uh, refrained from commenting or asking any questions. I would like to say that I've been in the party since 1980, and just about every convention that I've ever seen up until the last uh, maybe two, maybe one or two conventions, there have always been regional deals and regional agreements going on on the convention floor. So let's uh, let's do, disabuse ourselves of the idea that we do not have a tradition of uh, doing things at the last minute. And that's all I have to say on that. And I believe, Stefan, you had your hand up, and then we're going to go to Phil. I do. Um, and this may be for Mr. Cheney's, but if anyone from the other side would like to weigh in. The question I was asking earlier to Mr. Jacobs about the 10% threshold, I see now this was in the actual regional agreement, I believe. It wasn't in the bylaws. And it, there's a provision in there which says the effective date of the agreement, okay, um, and it's it's effective upon filing with the secretary, which was done, uh, assuming it was um, a valid agreement. Uh, and then it, there's a provision, no state affiliate can withdraw their if their withdrawal will cause the region to go less than a 10% mark uh, at all. 
And so the question there, maybe for Mr. Cheney's is, uh, if we assume that the chair did have the authority to enter into the agreement, then wasn't it too late by the terms of the agreement uh, to for 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 the XCOM to countermand that and to uh, because it had already been submitted to the secretary? Do you agree with that, or would you have an argument against that? Well, again, the the agreement was on unauthorized from the beginning, but again, if if he had authorization, yeah. and if he had authorization and he did this, then yeah, maybe we would, I, I would have to agree with you, right? However, I think that's a piece of crap reason, uh, part of the agreement, which is why I wouldn't have signed it. But I'm just trying to make sure. I, so in other words, um, uh, uh, the reason, the problem with the agreement in your view is that if there was authority to enter into it and if it had been entered into validly, it, it was too late at that point for the XCOM to, to, uh, to undo that, even if it was within the window, is that I think that's correct. Yeah, I think it's it's correct too. So I mean, even again, if we at that meeting said, "Hey, we didn't like your your decision, withdraw, please, please, pretty please," it wouldn't have made a difference because of the of that of the agreement that he signed. If, however, it is unauthorized, so it wasn't authorized to begin with, and therefore we we don't have right. to withdraw because we're not in it. I mean, I frankly think the weakest part of your case is that um, you kind of concede that the chair could enter into another regional agreement. Um, I, so I don't. I didn't concede that. <laughs> did you not? I, well, I said he could renew the one that we had with the same terms. I said that would probably be okay. However, again, we were waiting to the last minute, uh, the la the XCOM before the convention, because again, con regions are formed at the last second. I just don't see how you can expect the LNC to know that, oh, the chair has the authority to enter this agreement, but not this one. Um, it seems like a nightmare. And and then so now you have to fall back on, well, he could have renewed the other one because there was no, no financial obligation, but there was a potential financial obligation in the other agreement. But I've just read it, too, and it I think it does not it it, it contemplates a possible future agreement. But a, a contemplated future agreement is not a binding agreement. Um, it's st it's still a liability that we mm -hmm. would have to discuss, and it wouldn't be ordinary business if there is a liability attached. All and right. Again, well, it is a different it is a different mm -hmm. agreement than the original the what was already a standard uh, agreed upon agreement beforehand of Region okay. Six. Okay, I'm going to move on to Mr. Anderson, who's been waiting patiently for a while. Go ahead, Phil. Thanks. With respect to Mr. Chenise and his answer, uh, that's his opinion, Mr. Kinsella. Uh, as somebody who helped, you know, start this process of um, addressing this issue with our with our chair, I wouldn't have agreed that that renewing Re Region Six was within the authority of the chair. I wouldn't, based on our bylaws. Uh, so that's number one. But also something that Mr. Jacob said twice said twice that I would disagree with. You know, that the idea that we should have done something in the two years. Uh, since our last convention in order to address this lack of guidance from the bylaws as to whether the chair had authority. Uh, I, I won't say that our bylaws are airtight, but we had been operating under those bylaws and things had been playing out at every convention and every cycle the way that we expected them to based on our reading of those bylaws. So it's not as if there was a big hole that we ignored and therefore the LPWI executive committee is Maybe. at fault for being derelict. It's more oh. that other people are That's interpreting our bylaws hold. and we object to that. It's and it, it doesn't hold water. Thank you. All right. We're going to go to Mr. Latham, please. Uh, Thank Mr. you. Mr. Secretary, how much time do we have left? We have eight minutes. All right. Eight minutes out of a 90 minute hearing. So let's make it quick and concise. Go ahead, Rob. Sure. I didn't have a question until Mr. Anderson made his point. So uh, you said that your chair wouldn't have had the authority to form an agreement with Region 6, which I guess we're operating under the assumption it did not have any kind of financial law obligation. So why do you why do you say that? What's going on in your bylaws that even an agreement with Region 6 would not have been authorized? Because uh, it's not ordinary business. It's never been treated as ordinary business. The, the precedent, even though, sorry, even though, uh, that's been set aside and termed custom. It's still a common understanding of the body who has the authority uh, to conduct business on behalf of the party between conventions. And so we didn't think it was an issue going forward. It did not seem to be an issue with our bylaws until that meeting on May 19th, when we were told 
that uh, Mr. Ecker had signed that agreement. Thank you. Um, I would like to remind our participants, please do not make accusations that are not backed up with documentation in the chat window. Thank you. Are there any other questions from Judicial Committee members? Mr. Secretary, how are we doing on time? Seven minutes. Okay, we still have seven minutes. If anyone else wishes to make a comment, go ahead, Rob. Um, I commented this in the chat, but I just want to be clear for everybody here. So here, listening to the, the, the petitioners here, they don't dispute that the LNC or the chair had the right to make the decisions they did, just that what they were deciding on was null and void. Am I correct? All right. So can somebody, one of the petitioners, please spell out specifically what you think the JC's job is here on this decision? according to the the bylaws and what we're supposed to rule on. So I believe you should invalidate the regional agreement as far as Wisconsin is concerned. Wisconsin should not be in that region. Um, again, it was unauthorized and you can eat. So you could either do it that way or you can call the entire region invalid because of us, uh, because of our participation in it. I don't think that's the right call. And I'm not asking for that, but it is a valid outcome of this. Um, what we're asking is that Wisconsin be out of the, the agreement, the uh, sustaining members be removed that uh, Wisconsin provided. And if there is a uh, problem with the amount of uh, region reps, then that would be mitigated by uh, uh, by the, the members, the remaining members of the region. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, I am seeing a, a lack of uh, further information gathering, so I'm going to say that we are at the end of our agenda, and therefore this uh, hearing is adjourned. You just missed Blay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, his question might have been, what are we, we, we're meeting after this, but we're probably not going to do it with everybody present, so how are we doing that? Um, we're Should just we leave and come back.